Hey guys, and welcome back to another very exciting Facebook tutorial. I'm going to be showing you how to make more friends and uh, how to fool everyone into thinking that you have a better life than you do. That's not entirely true, but if we should be friends, mind you. I think that's a great idea. Um, then, we, then we can like, like each other's photos and shit, and we can like share our experiences. It's going to be amazing. So let's jump into DaVinci Resolve, and I'm going to be talking about how I got from, uh, say, this shot to this. So it's the same shot, obviously, but what I've done is enhanced certain features of this young man's face, and uh, also played with things like contrast and color, and uh, the results, dare I say, are magnificent. <laughs> so how did I get to this place and uh, what were the thought processes along the way? Now I'm not going to show you how to use DaVinci Resolve um, uh, as a software guide. Um, you can look that up on YouTube. There's hundreds of tutorials that teach you how to import these drives, how to manage your footage, um, how to conform the footage to a timeline, but basically I want to talk about the coloring aspect. So let's jump straight ahead into that. Now here is the finished product. DaVinci Resolve works with nodes. Now this might look like a very complicated... Now this may seem like a very complex uh, grade, but when you break it down, it's actually quite simple. Basically all we're doing is we're saying, first step, let's balance the nodes. Second step, let's have a look at different aspects of the image that we want to adjust. Uh, third step, let's have a look at the focus of the image and where we want our um, viewer to look. How do we enhance that? And then we have a final contrast node and then just a final minor adjustment node. But I'm going to go through all of this stuff right the fuck right now. So let's have a look at the original shot right here. Now it was shot on red. I shot this with my Red Scarlet X. Actually the very first film that I shot with my Red Scarlet X. And um, if we have a look at the clip properties here, you can see that we, uh, by default, the way I shot this was uh, with red color, three science, and a gamma curve of red gamma three. Now what the hell do these things mean? Well, the color space is referring to red's interpretation of the color from the sensor. So when you press record, you're going to be recording or decoding the raw data into this specified color range, which Graham from Red has created in his team. Now this is their best, uh, most latest color science, which is Red Color 3. Now remember, these are starting points for our grade. The next thing is the gamma curve. Now it's very important to understand what a gamma curve is, and it's important to understand why it's powerful to be able to adjust that. So when you're shooting raw, you have the ability to change this gamma curve. Basically, a gamma curve is designed to make the image look good straight out of the box. The gamma curve gives the flat-looking raw data contrast, saturation. It gives the image a much more pleasing look to start with. But because we're grading this image, I want to be in charge of that gamma curve. I want to be the one who creates that look. So it's ideal to actually shoot and record in a gamma curve that's much, much flatter than this. Because what this is doing is actually already crushing out detail. Even though it's quite a flat looking image, if we go to the decode using clip instead, and I change my gamma curve to red log film, look how much flatter it is again. That actually looks terrible, doesn't it? But the beauty is it's giving us more control because we are the masters of this color. We, we want to start from the very beginning. We don't want the camera to do um, virtually anything in terms of the aesthetics of the image other than give us the most information possible. So that's why people talk about shooting flat and um, that's exactly what we've just done here. Thanks to the ability of RAW, we have uh, changed our gamma curve to red log film. Now I do suggest using red color 3. So here we have a good starting point but what, what do we do creatively to make this shot really really sing? Because if you compare these two shots they're vastly vastly different. So the first thing we do is we look at the contrast of the image. Is there a black point in this image? I don't think there is. It looks very washed out to me. There's no pure black in here. Now you might think under this little collar here or maybe that black stripe there is pure black. But hold on a second, let's compare it to this black here. That's pure black. So we actually have no pure black. Now I'm just using these as a guide here, but what if we need to scientifically prove that we have no pure black? So let's right click on our image and go to show scopes. Now what we're going to do for the most of this um, tutorial is just be using the waveform monitor. So what I'm going to do is go to this top left hand scope and click on this little rigid button, change that to waveform. And now if I click on one up, it'll just show me the waveform which is slightly bigger too. We can en enlarge that to give us even more definition, which is great. Now we're talking about creating a black point and if we look at the information that lies on this graph, 
0 representing pure black and 1023 representing pure white. We can see that most of our image lies in the center. There is no pure black, there is no pure white. We need to expand our contrast. So what we're going to do to do that is jump over here to this little wheel and we're going to play with our color wheels. Now our three-way color corrector, our color wheels, are broken up into three sections. No surprise there. Each section, lift gamma game represents, um, basically if you just put it in layman's terms, lift represents your shadows, gamma g represents your midtones, and gain represents your highlights. So shadows, mids, and highlights. Now each wheel can play with the color of each portion of that image, so the color of the shadows, the color of the midtones, and the color of the highlights. But we also have this little slider down here which allows us to uh, move those values around. Now what we want to do first is grab our lift and slide it to the left and drop all of our information down to the bottom of the screen. So now you can see right here that we actually have a pure black point. And my guess is that this portion of the image, if we use this as a guide of our um, visual representation, if we overlay this graph onto this image, it actually represents everything you see in proportion. In other words, if we jump across uh, this much from left to right and jump across this much from left to right, you can see that there is a pure black point right here. So if we could overlay that on there, that would be cool to demonstrate that. But you understand what I'm saying, right? So now we have created a black point, but the only pure black in this image at this stage is this portion of his backpack strap and maybe a little bit over here on this portion of his backpack strap. But before we jump ahead and just agree that that's pure black, there's something that I need to mention about a cast in the shadows. Now when you look at the waveform monitor you can see that there are indeed colors, red, green and blue, but there's also variations in color like purple or pink or white. Now what does this mean? Well it means that when these colors of light overlap each other, if they overlap at all exact equal proportions, the light actually turns white, which means this is a pure white or slash gray neutral light shining through. So when all red and green blue channels match, they turn white. This is really important to understand because when you look at the shadows, you'll notice that they're actually blue and green and the red is sitting much higher. So when you're balancing an image, first we want to create contrast, but we also want to keep note of the color cast that lies within those shadows. So how do we adjust that? Well, let's jump straight to our color wheel this time and let's slide it around and just look what happens to those shadowy colors. What we want to really do, if we really wanted to balance out these shadows, is we want them to be white. So if we just slide them around a little bit, we're getting a much more balanced black. So now these shoulder straps are actually black. They're not just half black because the red channel wasn't actually touching black. They're actually pure black. But not all portions of our shadow is, but that's fine. So you can see over here that this portion of our shadow realm has red or magenta in it, but that's fine. So once you understand that, you're off to a very good start. The next thing we want to do is play with the highlights. Now if you look at these highlights, you can see that there's a bit of green in our highlights. So once again, we want to correct that. So what I'm going to do is slide our highlight gain slider around. And once again, we want our highlights to all match and be pure white. So that's looking better. Now we have almost a pure white. It's got a little bit of yellow in there, but that's fine. It is sunlight, right? And this is actually um, referring to his hair here. This is referring to the sky over here. So what we've done now, we've, we've balanced our shadows and we've balanced our blacks, but we still need to increase the brightness of our highlights because if we look at 1023, which represents pure white, we have no pure white in this scene. So let's just quickly have a look at the image and ask yourself, should it have a pure white? Um, portion of the image and indeed it should I mean look at this highlight in the back left corner here that is the sky and it's completely blown out so yes that should be pure white um, in terms of the first node when bouncing this image so we've done that what we need to do now is just bring it right up and as we've brought it up we've actually increased um, colors in red so we need to balance that out a little bit so just once again try and balance that out as best you can and let it hit the roof. So now we have a balanced image, roughly. So now that we've created a black and a white point, added contrast to the scene, I want you to look at the image and think about the guy's skin and look at the overall color cast of the image. To me it looks a little bit cool and a little bit green. 
So whenever you're doing color correction, you need to think in opposites. So what is the opposite color of green? And if you don't know that, it's pretty easy to figure out. All you do is look at these color wheels and look at 180 degrees. Just imagine you drew a line. So here's green. And if we look 180 degrees across from there, the opposite color is pink or magenta. So if you want to cancel out green, all you do is push magenta in. Now remember, it's a very sensitive um, adjustment. So remember, color correction is all about subtlety and just making very minor, minor adjustments. So all I've done there is gone to my gamma midtones and added magenta to the shot. Control F, full screen, Alt D. Now we're looking pretty good. We've got a balanced image and in terms of white balance, it's looking pretty damn good to me. So let's compare that to the finished grade. We're still a ways off. His skin looks a little bit pale. The background is looking almost black and white. The contrast could be increased. The sharpness could be increased. His eyeballs and the color of his eyes could be enhanced. All of these things we're gonna get into in a second. So now we wanna create a new node. So how do we do that? As long as you've double clicked on this node, if you press Alt S for Sam or um, Samantha, then you have node number two here. And now we can start grading that without affecting our original balanced node. But keep in mind that these are an addition. So every time you add a node in the chain, they're adding each uh, correction to get to a final result, which is over here. So we'll go into that um, in a bit more detail in a second, or it will make more sense as we go through this tutorial. But the second node, we want to make a selection. I want to start modifying um, specific portions of the image. So in our first node, we kind of did that using uh, this three-way color wheel thing where we selected shadows, midtones, and highlights. But now we're going to get even more selective and we're going to use a method called qualifying. So if we go over here to the second tool and click on qualifier, we have this little magic wand tool that we can use just like in Photoshop. And what we could do, for example, if I wanted to select this guy's skin, I could just click on the skin and it would give me a selection. But I want to teach you the ins and outs of this qualifier because um, it really pays down the track when you're making more difficult selections. So let's turn off that magic wand tool for a second and have a look at the image and ask yourself three questions. What color is this guy's skin? How saturated is the skin? And how bright or dark is the skin? So whenever you're trying to select something, you just need to ask yourself those three questions. And let's have a look at the image right now. So at the moment, the qualifier has not been set up to specify any range. It's just selecting the whole range. So what we want to do is have a look at the skin and ask ourselves, is it green, is it blue, is it yellow? Well, let's have a look at it. It's very, very desaturated. It's almost gray, but it definitely has a pinky yellow color to it. So what we're going to do is go to the width and just shrink in that width just to the color realm that we think the skin lies. Now, once we play with the width, we can then go to the center and slide that around as well. You'll notice as you slide it around, this color in the middle um, saturation area changes. So this gives you an indication of what color that we're gonna be selecting. So if we just move it around until it sort of starts to look like the color of his skin, which I would say is about there, we're off to a good start, at least with the chroma value. The next thing we want to do is say to uh, the qualifier, how saturated is that color? So if we look at the color of the skin, it's mostly very, very desaturated, isn't it? So if we go to the high point, we can move that down. It's definitely, we don't want to select anything in this sort of saturation area. We want to bring that right down because the saturation's almost black and white, the skin, but it does have some color to it. So that's looking pretty good. The next thing we're gonna look at is the brightness of the skin. So how bright is it? Is it in these shadow areas? Is it in these highlight areas? I'm gonna suggest that it's sort of around this area here. So if we just grab that low point and drag that up, and grab this high point and drag that down, let's see how close we got. So if we turn on the highlight area by pressing this magic wand, we can see, bam, I've done a pretty good job of actually selecting that skin. Now it still needs refining, but we actually haven't softened any of the edges of these selections. And we did that all um, just by asking those three logical questions. It's very, very powerful to understand what's happening behind the scenes instead of just clicking the magic wand and clicking on your image. So we've got to a pretty good place, but notice we're also selecting these darker areas of the image. So what we can do is go to our low part of the um, luminance and bring that up. And the higher we go, the less of that darkness we're going to select. So that's looking pretty good too. So now we have a rough, rough selection, which is looking pretty good. But you'll notice the edges of my selection are quite harsh. There's no softness at all. So what we can do is start to introduce different colors or subtract them. 
So I can shrink the width of my color range because I know I don't want to select anything green. But you can see here that my selection is actually including some green. So I could move the center of that over to the left. And now you can see I got rid of that green grass. So we're modifying, we're refining our qualification to select this skin. Now it's looking pretty good. I want to try and do a little bit better and not include um, that hair up there. So if we look at our brightness value, maybe the brightness can bring down. But not too much because then we're going to start losing highlights on his skin. This is where you have to be gentle. So now that we've got our rough selection, what we can do is actually soften the edges of these selections. And that's what these low soft, high soft uh, things actually mean. So if we can soften the edge of the high area, you can see now we're getting a much nicer selection, sort of just getting the skin. The next thing we could do is actually soften the whole mask itself. Now we go to this blur radius here and we can just increase that. And as you can see, if we go to 100, it's blurred it quite considerably. And that's looking pretty good. If we press play, you can see that we have selected the skin and pretty much nothing else. That's a great, great place to start. Now to help us refine that selection, I actually do want to include a little bit more of this shadow detail in here in my selection because that is part of the skin. So what I might do is just lower the luminance values a little bit more. But now remember we're starting to introduce portions of the image we don't want. So how do we fix that? So what we could do is in combination with our qualifying we can use a mask as well. So let's go to the mask or the window tab and let's just click on this circle. And now you can see that our qualification still remains, but it's only focusing inside of this circle. So I'm just going to reshape this just to match. And you know what? That's looking pretty good. We don't have to worry about those shadow areas, although we do have a few here that we've got to be careful of. So this might be a case of actually not using a circle, but using this Bezier tool instead. So then we can just make a custom shape, like so. And now we can soften the edges of that shape just by moving the yellow portion because the yellow portion of the window actually refers to how soft that part of the mask is as you can see down here. So the further away the yellow is to the green, that is how soft the selection is going to be. So we can just modify this. And uh, now we have, you know, pretty good selection. Watch out for the side of his neck there. So the other cool thing about DaVinci is now that we've created this selection, um, we're not working in Photoshop. This is not a still image. This is a moving image. So we need this mask to actually stick to this um, part of the image. So how do we do that? Let's go to this little crosshair uh, button here. And now if we just press play, it's going to analyze the scene and try and keep this mask stuck to this guy's face, which is awesome. But what I've found is, depending on the shot, if this guy is not moving towards or away from the camera, right? So we don't need to include a zoom analysis. So let's turn zoom off. And now if we just press play and just watch what happens, DaVinci will track the guy's face and usually do a very good job. So we might need to refine it a little bit, but if we just let that go, it's keyframing our mask for us, which is fantastic. So now we can just drag our cursor back to the point we pressed forward and now we want to track in reverse. So let's press backwards from there. For this exercise, that should do us. Now, you'll notice that the mask doesn't actually perfectly track. So sometimes you might want to go in and make some little adjustments yourself. So for example, where his face sort of crosses, his cheek crosses the mask there, I might want to make a little adjustment to that and keyframe it myself. So what I'm going to do is go back to where it's not crossing, which is there. And make sure I've double clicked on node number two, which is this node, the one we're working on. And then if we go to the keyframe down here, where it says number two, if I press A for auto, enable that. Now all I have to do is just make one little adjustment to our mask. And you'll notice a keyframe automatically pops up. So what we can do now is expand that keyframe window just to help us. And we can zoom in a little bit too. And now what I'm going to do is just scrub through this until his chin crosses that and I'm just going to keyframe it myself. 
And you could go through this whole clip and literally just keyframe everything just to a, a finite detail. But So now you'll see the mask animates according to my new keyframes. And just have a look at anything else that might need a little bit of attention where the tracker didn't do the best job. It's looking pretty good. Excellent. So I've just had a beer and a latte pretty much at the same time. So now we're ready to change the color of this guy's skin. And the beauty is because we've made an animated selection, let's just press Shift H to get rid of the, uh, the highlighted uh, portion. And uh, we can turn off the mask literally just by going over here and just going none. Um, now we can actually just play with this dude's skin, check it out. And the cool part is it animates no matter where he goes. So we have the power to create selections like that. It is a little bit fiddly when you first start, but once you get used to this, uh, the three questions and playing around with keyframes, although I do hate Da Vinci's keyframes, uh, once you sort of get gr a grasp on that, this stuff becomes a lot quicker and um, yeah, not so painful, maybe like the last 10 minutes was. So I'm sorry this tutorial um, is such a long and detailed one, but I really did want to put a lot into it. And um, since it's my first official, I guess, proper tutorial for DaVinci, I just did want to cover a lot. So the next thing we're going to do is make another selection. I'm not actually going to modify the skin at this stage, I just know that it's there ready to play with. When I first started using DaVinci, I just logically thought if I wanted to make a new selection, I would just literally press Alt-S and create a new node. And then, for example, if I did want to select this guy's eyes, maybe I would just grab a mask and just quickly shrink that down, rotate it a little bit, and then grab my uh, qualifier, use the magic wand, click on his eye, and, you know, adjust accordingly. And here we have his eyes, right? It's pretty uh, bad and rough. Um, job we've done here, but you get the idea. So we've adjusted his eyes and that should animate as long as we track that mask. But the point I'm trying to make here is that I've made a selection after the other selection. I've linked these two selections. But what, ha what is happening here in DaVinci is, like I said earlier, each node is an addition of the, of the previous node. So this selection is gathering information based on what happened before it. Now the problem with that is, sometimes I want to create a selection with inside of that skin. And sometimes maybe my skin selection actually did select his eyeballs somewhat. So what if I wanted to make multiple selections on this guy's face, but not in succession with each other? Is that even a word? It is now. Well, there is a way to do it. So what I'm going to do is just delete that second one. And instead of making a new node after this skin node, I'm just going to go up to, make sure I double click on the skin, go up to nodes, and this time I'm going to go add parallel node. So now I have this sort of crazy looking setup which might look confusing but it's actually pretty simple. We've got our original balance node here and then we're going to have a group of nodes that all reference the original balanced node. So instead of creating a selection after this skin selection, I'm creating selections, let's add another one, node add parallel node, I'm going to be able to create multiple selections that are all stemming from this original node. And that's a really powerful and useful technique. So let's go ahead and get started. I am going to go ahead and select this hair because I want to be able to have the option to play with the color of that hair. So I'm just going to double click on node 4, rename it, right click and change the label to hair. And once again, I'm going to go into my mask and actually before you choose a mask, always just try and make a selection just with the qualifier. We're not going to go into the three question phase here. I'm just going to go automatic style, choose the magic wand and click on his hair. Just click in around until you find something that gets most of the hair and nothing else. Now I want to increase the range of hair that it selects based on luminance. So I'm going to lower the shadow area so it starts coming in like so. So maybe to refine the edge of this, I could just increase the blur radius. And now we have a pretty good selection of his hair. It's not too bad. But what I might do is just lower it even more because I really want to try and get that whole head of hair. But you'll notice it's starting to introduce his skin. So how do we get around that? Well, we can refine it by changing our color selection. Notice our color selection is in the red realm. But with the hair, there's actually no red in that hair or virtually no red compared to the skin. So all we need to do is close the width of this and just shift it to the right and hopefully we're starting to 
get a better selection, which we are. So we've done this without an animating mask, which is really, really cool. And we can expand the radius of our selection too, just slightly. And that's looking pretty damn good. So we could, just for the hell of it, get rid of these extra components that have been selected by using a mask, but this time it'll be a lot simpler. So I'll just use a window um, and use a round one this time. And we just sort of plonk it there. And once again, just go to the tracking uh, palette, turn off the zoom for this particular shot. And now all we do is just press play and just analyze the frame. So it's going to do a very good job of that, I assume. And hell yeah, it is. <laughs> so once you've tracked that, um, just go back to the starting point where you started tracking. And you can just always go reverse as well and just track backwards. So just for the sake of this tutorial, I'll just use this sort of inner section here. Keeping in mind though that if your subject does walk off the frame, that's usually when the tracker stuffs up. So how do you combat that? Well, this is where you need to do your own specific keyframe. So for example, at the end here, the tracker would most likely stuff up and need a little bit of help. So what you would do is you go to that end frame just before he walks off and you need to double click on the layer that you want a keyframe, which is number four. Go down to number four, enable auto keyframes. Just move the mask slightly. And a keyframe should pop up down here. And then just scrub through the timeline until he walks off shot. And just drag your mask manually. So if we scrub through this now, you'll notice the mask is animated between those two points. And then you could go to the middle and just refine it a little bit. And just refine it again. And again. And there we go. So not only did we use the tracker to help track most of the shot, but in problem scenarios like that, you just need to enable uh, auto keyframing and yeah, and do it that way. So now that we have our hair tracked and our skin tracked, we're looking pretty good. Let's jump straight onto the next one. And this time I'm gonna select his eyeballs. So I'm just gonna zoom in here. And once again, I'm just gonna create a mask straight away. And just shrink that down just so it's only just like a pair of sunnies really because we're going to use a qualifier to help us so once we've done that you could just go straight to your tracking and just start tracking see how it goes so it should do pretty well it's nice high contrast good detail the tracker should be fine sticking on those eyeballs it seems to be doing a good job there and and in a second, we're just going to add a qualifier to this mask. So I'll just scrub back here until I find a clean frame where his eyes are open. And now I'm going to go to the qualifier window, click the magic wand, and just click on one of his eyeballs. And just click around until it grabs most of what you're looking for. And then we may need to go in and refine it a little bit. And then we could just go into our mask and just shrink it down a little bit because that tracking data will maintain. So that's looking not bad, not bad. So let's right click, change label, call it eyes. And um, if we press shift H and we just change the view to none. Now you can see that I can increase the brightness of his eyes. I mean, I haven't done the best selection there. Put some blue in there. And if I press control D and turn that on and off, you can see what I'm doing there. So obviously we can do a better job, but you get the idea. Now the beauty is that all of these selections, the skin, the hair, the eyes, are all um, based off this original balanced image. So they all have full data to be able to track from and key from. Now this parallel node here actually isn't very useful for us in this particular example, but it's absolutely necessary for this setup. So basically we have our balance node on the left, our parallel node on the right. And now before we go any further, we need to add another node. So now we have our group of selections. There's one more selection I need to create, and that is the shirt. Just because I feel like the shirt is a little bit lacking, it looks a little bit gray or blue, and I really wanna make it white and crisp. So I'm gonna create one more selection. So if we just double click on the top layer, and we go nodes and add parallel again, then we'll have an extra one there. Right click on that and just call it shirt. 
and double click on that node, go to our qualifier, click on the magic wand, same stuff, and just click on the shirt. Now straight away DaVinci's done a pretty good job there. It's going to increase the highlight range. And if we turn the hue off, let's just see what happens. Now what I'm going to do is actually draw a mask around the shirt, but in some instances, um, it, this is why it's handy to understand this three question system. What color, how saturated, how bright. Because when you're making a selection, sometimes you actually don't want to include color information. For example, this shirt, it's mostly luminance. And for me to get a clean key, I need to actually tell it, turn off the hue. And now you can see I've selected the edge of that as well, which is great. The only problem is now I'm selecting all um, variations of saturation and luminance, which does include the color red. So what are we going to do about that? Well, I'm just going to draw a mask around it, and that's going to help uh, our selection. But I am going to just increase this high range all the way to the top. So then I'll just go to our mask, and I'm going to use a Bezier tool this time, and just draw a nice... When I say nice, a quick mat around that. And, uh, yeah, just refine that a little bit. And what I could do is just increase the blur radius. And, you know what, I am going to reintroduce that hue. And just try my best, try my best to not select the skin, but try and get as much of that shirt as I can and just soften it even more. So that's not too bad at all. So um, we just need to track that mat now, so I'll just press Analyze Forward, and DaVinci's going to do an amazing job of that. Little things like this is really what brings, um, you know, color correction to life. It's what, what don't you like about the shot? That's the first thing I do. I look at it after my balance. I'm like, yeah, the skin doesn't look so good. The hair could be different. The, the white shirt's not crisp enough, the eyes aren't bright enough, so if you look at things like that, think about what you want to change, um, it's just awesome to be able to actually go ahead and do that, it's, and it's really rewarding when you get the result that you hoped for. So hopefully this tutorial is going to help you with that. So there I've analysed forward, I'm just going to quickly analyse back as well. And alright, so that's looking pretty good, let's just pause that there, press shift H, and um, yep. So now we have the shirt, the eyes, the hair, and the skin. This is really, really cool. So I'm just going to reset those eyes because I did play with those before. But we actually haven't done anything since our balanced grade, although we are very prepared to do so. What we're going to do now is, well, I'm actually not going to change any of these things just yet. I'm going to add one more node outside of this parallel node. Now this node is going to be called my uh, contrast node. and I haven't actually added a contrast curve, so to speak. We, what we did in that first node with the balancing was basically just giving the image some sort of contrast, but not a, not a look in terms of contrast. So now I'm going to use curves to create contrast. Now, if you don't understand curves or how to use them, I have a lot of tutorials on my blog, mattscottvisuals.com. Um, check out there, I've explained curves about a million times, but I'm just going to create an S curve right now, so I'll just drop the shadows a little bit and raise the highlights a little bit. So here we have some Pretty nice looking contrast. I'll just press Control D just to turn that on and off. And while we're at this contrast, I might just rename it and call it Color. You are? Yeah. Color contrast. So it's both. And uh, what I could also do is increase saturation by 10. So now the saturation's increased, the contrast is increased. If I just do uh, Control D just to cancel that node, we can see the difference there. So I actually haven't changed any of these components yet. All I've done is balanced the shot and added a contrast curve. So it's starting to look a lot better. But let's compare it to the uh, final shot. There's definitely a lot more color in the grass. His eyes are more pronounced. His skin looks better. Uh, you know, there's a few things we still need to go with this. But the beauty is most of the hard work is done and the rest is just fun tweaking. So the color contrast is done. But now we're gonna go back to the skin and we can just push in a little bit of warmth in there. Seeing as our highlights and mids can really create the look you want. And with the hair, I'm just going to add a little bit more yellow to the hair to make it look a bit more blonde. And with the eyes, I'm just going to increase the luminance of the eyes with the highlight slider and then the gamma slider. And I'm also going to drop some blue in there. And if we just zoom in, seeing as our highlights and mids can really create the look you want. 
And with the hair, I'm just going to add a little bit more yellow to the hair to make it look a bit more blonde. And with the eyes, I'm just going to increase the luminance of the eyes with the highlight slider and then the gamma slider. And I'm also going to drop some blue in there, and if we just zoom in, we'll go to the gamma and drop some blue in there as well. Now notice that the actual whites of the eyes have gone blue. So remember, whites being highlights, I would use the gain slider, the highlight slider, to push yellow to balance out that blue, because remember the opposites. So now the whites of the eyes are looking a little bit better, and we just push more blue in there. Try not to go too far. And if we look at the before and after, I just might go back to the skin and, uh, you know, I think it's just a little bit magenta. I'm just going to put a bit more yellow into that. Now I'm going to jump down to the shirt and I'm just going to increase the brightness of the shirt using the gain. Remember, it's all about subtlety. And I'm just going to push a bit of yellow into that as well, just to warm it up a bit. Now if we press Alt D, that's going to disable all nodes. So Alt D will show you the original shot. And you can see we've come quite a ways. But the beauty is we have a lot of control here. This setup really, really works. Now, what if I wanted to affect everything outside of a selection? The way DaVinci works is it's really powerful. Um, let me just demonstrate with a single node here. So I've just added a new node. And I'm just going to add a mask here. So here's a mask. Now, if I made that dark just by dropping a curve in there, you can see that the inside of the mask um, is dark. But what if I wanted to maintain that um, correction, but then add a correction outside of that same mask? Well, then all I do is right-click and go Add Outside Mask, and now you can see these two little, there's a dotted line there plus a solid line. So these nodes, 8 and 9, are linked. Uh, 8 is the inside and 9 is the outside. So now we can make 9 brighter or darker, so that's how that works. So the reason I brought that up is, let's delete those two nodes. I want to go to the skin node now, and I'm going to add an outside node to the skin. So basically everything outside of this skin, I want to add a blue tinge to the shadows. So we can go right click, add outside node, and you can see this little outside node that lives up here. And I'm just going to rename that and call it Cool Shadows. And basically just jump straight for the color wheels, go to the lift or the shadows area and just push blue into it. Now remember, just be very gentle and subtle about it. We could also drop the brightness of that. And if we just go control D, you can see the before and after there. So I just think that looks pretty cool. Um, finally, what we're going to do is, um, is add what I call a focus node. So if we go Alt-S, so double-click on the last node, go Alt-S for Sam or Samantha, and um, what we're going to do is just draw a simple mask around this guy's face, but I'm going to soften the absolute shit out of it, like so. And this is almost going to be like a vignette. But basically, on the inside of that mask, I'm just going to increase saturation by 3 or 4. I'm going to go to my sharpness, and I'm just going to add a little bit of sharpness. Uh, with the sharpness, the way it works, sharpening and softening, anything in the middle at 50, that means that there is no sharpness or softening happening. Anything above 50 is absolute softness. As you can see there, it's completely defocused in the middle now. And anything below 50 is sharpening. So now you can see that it's very, very sharp and it starts to introduce artifacts if you're not careful. Generally speaking, with red footage, I don't really like to go above, say, 46.46 sharpening, and even that's quite extreme. But you can see what it's done there. I've added sharpness and a bit more saturation just to the center. If we press Shift H, you can see this is the area that I'm affecting. And then on the outside of that node, I'll go right click, add outside node. On the outside of the node, I'm just going to go straight to my curve and just drop exposure a little bit. And while we're there, even though we have a super shallow depth of field, I'm just going to go to my blurring sharpening tool and just add a blurriness of about three. It's really going to force our viewer to look where we want them to look. Now, don't forget we have to track these masks. So we go to our tracking tab and we just press play forward. Now, the beauty of using the inside-outside method is you only have to track once because the outside node obviously affects everything outside of this mask regardless. So if this is tracked, then you know that your outside node is tracked as well.
So once you've done that and tracked backwards as well, you can see that we've got a pretty good looking grade. And obviously the beauty about this um, method, or the way of using DaVinci like this, is that you can change whatever the hell you want. So keeping this in mind, this is not the best way to do it, it's not the only way to do it, this is just a way that I find works really well. And it doesn't work for every shot either. So you really have to get good at um, mastering this qualifier tool, um, animating masks and things like that. But also just get good at looking at image and thinking, what is going to look good? What can I enhance in this shot? And even now when I look at it, I feel like his face could do with a little bit more light. So we could in fact go back to this number 9 node, click on the mask, shrink it down a little bit, and actually just increase brightness there, just a tad. And that's looking pretty damn good. So yeah, that pretty much wraps up my tutorial. Hopefully this was really helpful for you guys. DaVinci Resolve is a little bit daunting when you first jump in. But once you start understanding nodes and the power of nodes, but also understanding these simple tools and how they can really, you know, give you a lot of flexibility and freedom with color, you're going to really start enjoying it. And it's actually a really empowering process to learn color correction, um, especially since, you know, a lot of cameras are going raw these days. If you don't understand how to get the most out of your image in post, you're going to fall behind. So not only is it good um, to stay in the ahead of the game, but like I said, it's also very rewarding. So check out my blog, uh, be friends with me on Facebook, and uh, yeah, there'll be more tutorials to come. Thanks for listening. My name's Matt Scott, and I'll see you next time. And while you're on Facebook adding me, um, <laughs> why not type in Sissy Boy, and uh, in brackets, short film, and check out the work of Cameron McCulloch. He's the writer, director, and good friend of mine, who is the man behind the film. So go and check out their page, um, like it if you like it. I think it's jumping around festivals as we speak. But uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun to shoot. So it'd be great to get your support. Indie filmmakers, unite. <laughs> and what the hell, while you're on Facebook, type the ninja movies. And uh, check out the film I'm shooting right now. We're, I think we're eight days into principal photography. It's a 33 day shoot, feature film about ninjas. Who the hell doesn't like ninjas? If you don't like ninjas, you're probably a samurai or something like that. But anyway, I'm having an absolute blast shooting this film. And um, yeah, back to work tomorrow. I've had three days off. It's been freaking awesome. We've been in like mud trenches with guns and shit and um, explosions. Well, there's my alarm. Anyway, I gotta go. Thanks guys. Peace.